Okay, so our farm is uh, East Grand Forks, Minnesota. We're kind of in the heart of the Red River Valley. We're about uh, 350 miles north and a little bit west of here. So um, uh, pretty far north, I guess. Um, I'm not sure if there's anybody else that's um, up, you know, in that area, but um, we're uh, I'm a third generation farm with my brother. Uh, I got a couple of nephews that are also farming. Um, about 100 years on the original farm. Uh, our total farm size is about 4,200 acres. So we've got 3,000 acres that are farmed organically in 2018, 2,600 certified, and 400 uh, still in transition. Uh, like Gary mentioned, the crops that we grow, um, dry beans is one of the big crops, mostly pentos, some dark red kidney, um, oats, corn, uh, red and yellow potato, um, and then on the conventional side, uh, wheat and soybean, and, and then uh, we use forage peas for cover crops and transitioning. So just some of our philosophy a little bit. Part of what we, um, uh, our mindset is to be proactive rather than reactive. You have to, in the organic world, it's, it's so much about timing and uh, attention to detail. Um, you gotta be ready before um, you know, the operation is required. Otherwise, uh, with the amount of acres that we're doing, you can get behind you know, in a hurry, and that's not something that, you, know, you know, not a place you wanna be organically. We focus a lot on uh, drainage, uh, surface and subsurface. We're flat, uh, medium to heavy soils, so uh, for us to be successful and then uh, with our you know timeliness operations, we can't have waterlogged fields, um, so uh, that's part of our focus. And then whatever we can do to uh, have healthy plants um, and promote uh, deep prolific root systems, it's kind of been something that has been on our you know our, our mindset for a number of years. And um, you know with that, then you get uh, it's kind of the foundation for stress proofing uh, the crop and. Um, you know, we also have found over the years, uh, you know, that uh, we want to work with nature. So we've we've been organic. Uh, our first field was uh, certified organic in 2007, um, but before that, we were um, doing a lot of things sustainable. We had an organic uh, neighbor about 30 miles away from us. That was kind of our mentor, and you know, we we're. Um, so we're growing uh, potatoes, and, and they're, to get quality red potatoes, it's really uh, dependent on having healthy soil uh, because it's, uh, even though you might grow a, a good potato that's going to store, uh, to market it, you got to have, you know, the quality and the visual, um, you know, so that, that ultimately came back to the soil health. So because of the potatoes and the dry beans, you know, we've been focused on soil health, uh, you know, even before we started to move into organic. Um, we kind of operate on a continuous improvement uh, mindset. Uh, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, so it, it, things just take time to evolve. And um, uh, they say when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, meaning sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and when you start seeking out that information, then it's like you have some aha moments or, uh, you know, things start to, you. Uh, meet different people or talk to different people or you learn new things that you can use. <clears throat> so some of our kind of basic principles is uh, to have a diversity of plants and biology out there, uh, have armor on the soil, try and reduce our tillage as much as possible even though we're organic, you know, we that's part of, we, part of our mindset. We like to try and minimize our tillage but yet we're still doing a fair amount, but I guess trying to be smart about it, and then always uh, having a live root or as much as possible. You know, uh, we're not uh, always able to do you know some of these things, but that's just kind of the background of, of uh, where our frame of mind is. And so, some of the observations on our farm: the the healthier the soil, the easier it is to have, uh, or the less weed pressure we tend to have. Um, which is a function of the, the drainage, um, you know, being smart about minimizing, managing your uh, compaction threats, um, also understanding, you know, how to be uh, minerally balanced and 
like Gary mentioned about uh, Dr. Albright, um, you know, we're still kind of learning on that, but, uh, you know, there's kind of the, um, the, uh, the balance with the, with the cations and, and one of the challenges that we have is, is uh, we've got high mag soils generally and, you know, so, you know, maybe our calcium needs to be higher, our mag, or, uh, mag needs to be less and our uh, potassium needs to be a little bit higher on that, on that uh, balance. And we also, um, yeah, so the healthy soils is also, you know, they're biologically active. And like I say, even before we were organic, um, you know, we were doing things on a sustainable uh, platform and using biologicals. But now uh, with the amount of organic that we have, uh, you know, some of the key products that we found real uh, impactful are the SP1, the micro seed treat, and then also the, the residues for nutrient cycling and to help manage the weeds. Uh, so rotation is one of the methods that we use to help break weed cycles. We have you know, a variety of crops, uh, so that's a, a part of it. And then uh, the Manitoba 4010, uh, like when we've been transitioning uh, for us, that's been a, um, a crop that works well as a smother crop. Um, you know, you can plant it alone or with oats is what's kind of worked for us. It, it works really well for uh, kind of um, uh, fracturing the soil and, and building soil health. And also you can use it ahead of a, a corn crop to build nitrogen um, uh, organically. So some of the uh, main tools that we use, uh, we've got a number of tools in the toolbox like Gary mentioned, but these are some of the main ones. Um, We've got a 52-foot field cultivator. It's uh, we need to add another one uh, for this spring, just because we um, we need to get more done. We're kind of short of capacity there. But basically, we're running a little bit wider sweep, nine-inch sweep, um, six-inch uh, shank spacing, and then we'll pull a crumbler behind that. Um, you know, if the conditions are conducive, um, we also use a McFarland spike harrow. Um, we use, uh, we've got two uh, hats and Beckler uh, time meters. They're pull type units, 88 foot. We've got two 88 foot pull type rotary hose. Uh, and then we've got four row crop cultivators, single shank, rolling shields, three pull type and one mounted. And so you'll see in some of the pictures, we've got, you know, some older tractors. You've got older tractors, newer tractors, but basically to have, you know, we, we generally have to have all this, all these tools hooked up so it's a lot of, um, you know, they could be going, some of them or almost all of them at once, you know, as far as what our demands are to be on time and, and to keep up with the organic uh, 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 workload. So, so that's our main kind of tools. Um, and then here's some other ones. We got a flexible harrow, a couple of Melrose harrows, um, some weeders. We've got a, a power hiller that we use in the potatoes. And then some of our fall tillage tools. Uh, we've got a Selford. Um, vertical wavy coulter tool. Um, we've got a case uh, 870 uh, ripper, which, um, you know, the ripper sounds bad, but we're, we used to run uh, an older version of the, the DMI, and, and what we did on those is we put on a, uh, like straight legs with kind of a, I think it was a brilliant point, but basically, so what it would do is we would, we would be fracturing and not having a lot of disturbance. So our point was to try and, you know, get oxygen and, and, um, and moisture, you know, into the profile and, and allow for that deep prolific root system. But, um, so those tools are kind of older. We've updated to that 870, which, you know, we're not looking to have a lot of uh, disruption of the house, so to speak, but we do want to, you know, kind of create a slot that, uh, you know, and then have the right point so we can kind of lift and fracture and, uh, you know, allow for oxygen um, you know, for the, for the biology, to support the biology. And then um, this fall we use the Degelman Pro-Till on our corn residue, uh, basically to, you know, help, you know, either, um, like after the, after the case ripper, to uh, get that, the residue in contact with the soil, um, or when it, we were harvesting corn into the middle of December, um, I guess early December, um, unfortunately, but, uh, so if, when the ground was froze, then we just ran the Degelman on its own, you know, kind of right after the combine. So that was, um, 
basically um, getting that residue in contact with the soil for that to start that digestion process. And then we also use manual labor, um, you know, to walk through the fields, and we try and be proactive on that too. You know, we have, we have a we have a dedicated crew, and we we communicate and, and try and be in advance. But then sometimes, uh, if if they're weathered out or they can't, uh, you know, get enough done, then we start to fall behind. Even though we have a, a proactive plan to be in there, um, you know, the labor is. It's not like flipping a switch, you know. It's uh, there, you know. There's uh, there's some challenges there as far as timing too. So, and there's only so much capacity there with the labor. But I mean, it does work good in the fields where there's not a lot of weed pressure um, because uh, they they can tend to get overwhelmed if there is a lot of weed pressure, and so they're going to want to do the fields that are not so bad uh, because you know they can they can go through it and then it goes from little bit dirty to clean and everybody feels good but so labor is a component we've got a hydraulic weed puller that's high maintenance and it's a lot of just a lot of management and so that's not a great answer but we have used it um, and then we um, we've got a mounted uh, sickle bar there'll be one picture later uh, basically we bought a John Deere head that's like 22 feet and that's that's what our uh, <coughs> kind of what uh, well, that's a size that works for us with our row spacing. And so we took that head and we gutted it and we mounted it on the three point behind the tractor. So then like in our dry beans, so the corn and the, and the dry beans are kind of our two big organic crops. And the challenge with the dry beans is that, um, you know, they're not, they're not a real competitive crop. And organically, that's what you, that's one of the, control measures is to have uh, canopy and competition while the dry bean, you know, you're kind of like, uh, um, that's that's a big challenge that you don't have that that canopy. So basically, um, we we need some tools to help uh, help us when we have late, you know, some late season weeds that are growing above the dry bean. And that sickle was one of them that we, uh, you know, I think it was about three years ago that we set that up. And then we also, you know, Mow our, it, it sounds kind of um, not that important, but you know, we mow our ditches, mow our tree lines. If we have some uh, a weed patch on a headland or a certain area, a pocket in a field that's getting out of hand, we'll just mow it, you know, rather than try to fight it, you know. So, uh, and then, you know, there's always a wish list, uh, and um, but yet we're on a budget, unfortunately. Um, so, but uh, in 2018, this last year, we, uh, we put together a 44-foot flamer, and that is set up where we can broadcast our band. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there's not a, there's not a, well, I can't go to my uh, John Deere dealer my, or my case dealer and say, uh, yeah, I'll take, uh, you know, your, one of your 44-foot flamers. You know, they're not, I mean, there's no, they're not really out there readily available, so. Um, we, you know, we uh, built that flamer, and you know, we. It's uh, a lot of times we get ourselves into trouble in the winter time. We, it's easy to dream up stuff, and um, but then uh, you know, it's hard to get it. Uh, you know, basically, we shouldn't be building equipment. You know, we're, we're farmers, but uh, you know, this particular unit we had to build. So, um, and and with that, we we weren't out in the field as soon as we should have been. You know, we we're still waiting for fittings and this kind of thing. So um, so this year, we were kind of under capacity. Our, our corn acres went from 500 to 1,200 in 2018, and we knew that we were gonna need some, you know, some, uh, you know, this flame to help us, but the tool wasn't ready, you know. Uh, we were still building it, and we're, and we're, you know, my brother and I were saying, you know, yeah, we need to be out flaming, but we're still waiting for fittings. So, that was one of the challenges this year. We were just a little bit behind coming out of the shoot. Um, and then for 2019, well, we, we were actually building two flamers, but the the, the bigger one, the 88 foot, uh, you know, are, we're, we're about 80% uh, uh, complete with that. We didn't get it online for last year, but it should be online for this year. So hopefully we'll have all that capacity out of the shoot, you know, so we'll be um, early, you know, for, with our timing. And then another tool that we um, 
are adding for 2019 is the uh, weed zapper, it's called. And it's, uh, it'll be uh, 44 feet of electrode that uh, um, it's got a, a 200 kilowatt generator on the back and then electrodes are on the front and I've got some um, uh, pictures of that unit um, that we'll look at. So then some other things, uh, you know, as far as part of our mindset that we'll kind of have, that we'll try but maybe won't always work is, uh, you know, uh, from the standpoint of having a, a live root or having soil protection or supporting biology, you know, uh, we're so far north that, um, you know, we've, we've tried some four, five, six way mixes, um, but our growing season is so short, it, it gets to be a little bit of a challenge to justify some of that seed because we just don't have enough, uh, uh, you know, heat units and window to, to really make it work. So we're just, you know, for now we're just doing some uh, kind of keep it simple with, you know, whenever we can get out there with oats or peas or rye is kind of our go-tos, you know, to do something, at least do something rather than nothing. But so, uh, so we, these are some of the scenarios that we'll try and get some, uh, some uh, cover crop or green manure out there. Um, basically, uh, after oat or driving harvest, or mostly after oat, um, you know, we will go with the oat and forage pea mix. That's one option that could be, and that's kind of building for a, a next year's corn. Um, the fall seeded uh, winter rye is, is something that will work even after a, a corn harvest for us. And then we'll terminate it before planting. Um, sometimes we'll get some frost seeded oats out in the spring just so we have something. We've got some later planted dry bean or potato. Um, so you've got something to kind of jumpstart uh, the biology. Um, and then something that we've talked about but haven't tried is uh, like a spring seeded winter rye. Uh, and we have to figure out that timing. Uh, so basically, uh, that rye would only, and we, we've done this on some, uh, on a real small scale, a few acres where if you plant that, if you spring seed a winter rye, it's only going to get about four inches tall. And so you've got kind of a mat of protection. So we're trying to figure out uh, if we can bring that into our dry bean or even a soybean. We don't really do soybeans organically, but uh, um, so that might be something that you can have as a carpet for uh, some weed suppression. And then um, something else that we've tried uh, is you know some meat and red clover under the oats uh, just before the last time weed. And then you know uh, like what Stan was showing, uh, having some species under seeding the corn. That's something that we'd love to do, but um, not. We haven't got there yet, so so kind of with our our uh, just a, a generality with our uh, oats, corn, and beans. Uh, you know, if we have some of those uh, so those green manures growing in the spring, whether it's the, the rye that's overwintered and, and growing, um, or some uh, spring seeded uh, oats, uh, usually we'll uh, try and cultivate that about 10 to 14 days before planting. So whether it's your green manure or you've got weeds growing, uh, usually, and if we're planting mid to late May, usually we gotta cultivate once yeah. earlier and then we'll cultivate again right before planting. Um, and then we'll um, we'll run the McFarland Harrow after that cultivator, usually a few hours, because if you've got any uh, chunks of soil that have any weeds, you know, rather than them popping up right away, that McFarland, when you come back a, a few hours later, it'll bust that up and you kind of start with a clean slate. Um, and then so uh, we put a lot of emphasis on our planter. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're waiting, um, you know, so we're uh, waiting for the soil to warm up and also to get some weed flushes out. And then when we plant, we wanna make sure that we're being very particular with our with our planting setup. Uh, there's a lot of good technology out there, uh, you know, in today's world. And so we can, uh, the whole thing is we gotta have, you know, fast, uniform, uh, even emergence, uh, you know, corn, beans. And so we're, we're waiting, 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 and then we have to get a, a lot done and we want you know fast uniform emergence because we want the crop to jump out ahead of the weeds, and so uh, that being said, 
all our seed is treated, um, you know, to give energy and protection, uh, SP1, MST, um, and some other products, you know, so we have a good, good treatment uh, on the seed. We've got an infro package, and then this year we're adding a, a two by two by two treatment, which uh, last year, uh, 2018, we went to, uh, we upgraded our planter, and our, our previous planter, we had actually three different liquid systems on it. Um, we had two, uh, two lines running in furrow, and then we had a, a single two by two on the front of the row unit. Well, last year, when we updated the planter, we just went to a single product in furrow because of, of the time that we had. But this year, we're bringing the two by two uh, back to this planter. Um, and, but what's a little bit different from the previous one is we're actually going two by two by two. So rather than just a single two by two up front on the old one, we're gonna have um, basically uh, ability to ban uh, nutrition on both sides of the row um, rather than just the one side, you know, so and we feel like that's going to be an advantage. Could you, um, explain, could you explain two by two by two, what does that mean? So basically two by two just means that you're two inches to the side and two inches down and then the other the other two means that we're instead of a single one on the front like we used to be, we're going to have uh, two on the back. So we're basically two inches over and two inches down, you know, in two places rather than just one. And we feel like that balance of nutrition is going to be, um, and it's kind of like what Gary was talking about, how you can do more with less, uh, be more efficient with your um, nutrition dollar, you know. Um, so then in general, in general, you know, uh, you want to be early and often generally speaking, and that's why we have to have the tools and the capacity and everything kind of hooked, um, because we don't, you know, this year we were, 2018 we were fortunate, the weather was for the most part cooperative, but uh, you know, the windows generally are small, so you gotta get in and get out. And um, uh, you know, so we've got uh, the time we need the rotary hole, um, <laughs> We use a rotary hole if we have crusting because again we want to we don't want to have that crop struggling. Uh, you know if if, uh, if you have a crusting event, um, you know rain and then it gets sun. You know you don't want that crop struggling. You want uh, and then also uh, if there's uh, from what I've been told if there's if you do tend to have a crusting effect, you know basically you're you're building your CO two levels in the soil and that's um, you know supporting weed seed germination. So um, so we'll use those tools as needed uh, and then we'll, so usually uh, tying weed uh, and then uh, we want to broad, or, you know, we want to broadcast flame kind of earlier like what Stan was talking about um, on the corn, uh, you, know, with, you know, from probably V2 to V3 is our target. Um, and then as we get a little bit bigger crops, we'll be row crop cultivating and then, um, and then we'll band flame, the target on the band flame of the corn would be, you know, after that uh, V6 to V7. So here's uh, some oats, and I, I, you know, I mentioned before that we, we treat all our seed. Well, this past year we had uh, the, uh, the photo on the, on the right side there. We took a shortcut and we did not treat the seed. Uh, and it was actually, it's actually two different varieties, but you can still sell. You know, you can still see the difference, uh, treated versus not, and um, you know. So that was like the only seed that wasn't treated in 2018, and we honestly thought that we were going to have to work that field up because the uh, the emergence was so slow and so thin that we and then the weeds were worse because of it. So that's that's kind of the bottom line is. Uh, you know, you're waiting, you, you get the wheat flushes out, you're waiting to plant, you want to plant with good seed and, and proper planter setup, and you want the, the crop to be off to the races. Um, the, the crop on the right, it, uh, you know, we had weed pressure that, that uh, was challenging it and it was just you know, not as good. So you want, you want to be able to, um, kind of like the horse race, I guess, uh, come out of the chute, you know, fast and strong. So. 
So this is just a picture of the organic oats ready to harvest. Um, there is weeds out there, and you know, but. Um, So one thing that you see is that we've got a good canopy, uh, and that's part of the, yeah, we can maybe turn that down. The one thing you want to do is have good canopy, good competition, and that's what, with this particular variety of oats, that's what we have. And then here we're, um, this is the oats going into the bin, but we're running through a quick clean. There's quite a bit of foxtail, pigeon grass. But uh, so it's, uh, you know, you don't want the weeds going into the bin. Um, and it's just an opportunity to, you know, get the, the seed out of the field. Here we had, uh, we've been trying to, you know, explore doing, we've been trying to explore doing uh, uh, some no-till, uh, you know, like pinto, uh, possibly uh, into, uh, into, into a crimped rye. And this is the this spring we had some rye that we just didn't have enough biomass, so we ended up. Um, and our spring was kind of challenging; it was kind of cool and wet and and late, and so uh, we didn't have enough biomass, uh, and so we ended up working it in, which is fine. It's just that it got a little bit bigger than we wanted, um, and so we had to. We didn't have a tool, so we demoed this tool. Uh, for this field, and uh, we actually had to go over it twice. So this was like the first pass, and then we had some rain, and then we come in and hit it again in a few days, and planted our pinto beans, and it actually um, ended up being you know decent. And so I guess the one positive, you know, it wasn't exactly you know what we had planned uh, as original game plan, but uh, you know, so some of the positives is you've got, uh, you had protection, you had armor on the soil, you had protection, you're jump-starting the biology, you had roots growing there, uh, you know, so um, those are some of the positives. This is a, uh, our planter, uh, this planter was new to us, or it was a new planter last year, it's a John Deere Exacta Verge, and that's kind of our, you know, uh, we're really stressing the, uh, with the corn and the, and the beans, the, um, the importance of the the fast uniform uh, emergence, and um, so we upgraded planters. Uh, but we, like I say, I felt bad that we our planter before actually had a little bit better liquid system. But now for 2019, we're bringing some of that back, so we've got more options um, to get nutrition, you know, uh, to the to the early growing crop. So this is. Uh, um, I know Ben will have better pictures of the time meter. We, most of the time, we don't, it's like we could have a, uh, one person just taking pictures and video, uh, but uh, usually most of what you're going to see is from the cab. Um, we've got a drone, but unfortunately I'm the only one that uh, can run it to the meal. I'm usually in a tractor, so. Um, but uh, this is a time meter, um, 8 8 foot pull type um, in the pinto bean. Uh, this is the time meter in corn. And we were actually, since we were behind on the flamer, and we were, we were you know, doing this anyway, but, um, you know, we were, you know, we were time, you know, we'll, we'll time meet and rotary hole our corn um, because our flamer capacity last year was not where we needed it to be. But, you know, this was a very good, uh, uh, good option, and I know, um, talking with uh, Matt Saddleberg a month ago, he was kind of enlightening me on something that they're doing on their farm that uh, is uh, it's a concept that I like, but again, uh, you know, our budget is kind of spent for this year, so I don't think we're going to be doing anything, but um, I think uh, uh, Ben will expand on that, but it's uh, it's kind of a good option um, uh, with the camera, camera hitch uh, with the time meter. 
So that's more time weed in the corn. There's time weed in, uh, I'm not sure if that's kidney or uh, pinto. So the one interesting thing we, um, uh, last year we had some conventional kidneys and we had a fall, um, we had some uh, sonalan that was down in the fall and uh, and then other than that we, on those conventional kidneys, uh, we, uh, you know, we bought treated seed, but other than that, the rest of the year ended up being uh, sustainable conventional. We had no other, and it wasn't, we weren't necessarily planning that, um, but uh, that's the way it worked out. We had, um, you know, because we were, since we have the capacity with the rotary hoe tine weed, we were bringing, we're bringing those tools into our conventional, and, and then we ran labor through the conventional kidneys, uh, definitely, I think twice actually, it was probably three weeks apart, but uh, we actually had some of the highest yielding conventional kidneys that we ever had, and I think part of it was due to, you know, you're eliminating one of those stressors with the, uh, with the herbicide treatment, you know, so um, we have the capacity, so we're bringing some of that, you know, whether it's the input you know, the input uh, knowledge that we've learned from the sustainable organic, you know, we're, we're bringing that into the conventional side, the, the few acres that we have left. This is a rotary hoe and pinto beans. And then we will put, like, we've got a, uh, a John Deere ATU on the steering wheel, so, um, you know, whether it's for turning around or uh, we essentially have auto steer on these older tractors, which the air conditioning isn't working, but he does have auto steer. He's got the windows open. Um, this is a, another tool. It's a 88-foot uh, uh, harrow with uh, Melrose, Melrose harrow sections, which is uh, the times are spaced a little bit more apart. Uh, this particular field, corn ground the previous year, pintos into corn ground, and so we had a little bit more residue there, um, but we, uh, you know, so we ran that tool in that situation. And I know Lynn Brackey out of Moorhead, you know, he, that's actually kind of where we got the idea, or we, this, this building that tool, you know, we're not supposed to build things, but my brother, that was kind of his pet project, and that was actually the first time we used it. We, we didn't, you know, we're using the time meters because they work. Um, but uh, so he, my brother was happy that we got to use that. Uh, uh, but I know Lynn Brecky, he, he also uses the mill rope. So this is just an example of, uh, we, we cut our beans, uh, so, um, so we, we knife them uh, underground. They're cut just below le uh, ground level. And then we uh, use a pick at one step to get them into windrows and then we pick a combine. So this is just an example of us cutting uh, the, the pinto beans and that's what they look like after the cutter before the windrower. And then here we're combining pintos and you can see some green, there's some weeds in there. Um, and it yeah, I mean, if you have any issues or any weak links in your in your drive line or that kind of thing, you're going to probably find it at this stage. Um, you know, if if you have some weed pressure uh, in your windrow, um, uh, you know, so it's not it's uh, it's not as uh, uh, clean and uh, and uh, as as the conventional, but uh, it it does work. You just got to drive a little bit slower and and kind of watch your feeding. But uh, yeah, Ben and I were just talking an hour ago about you know burning belts and and you know there's a uh, gearbox that you'll take out and so you'll find all the weak links uh, um, eventually. And you get you know faster and better at fixing that stuff. So this is uh, harvesting kidney beans and there's some there's some weeds in the in the in the windrow but they're kind of dried down. Um, And then, so one of our challenges with the dry being a little bit, every, every situation is a little bit different, but on the bottom side, basically when we, 
when we uh, windrow, we're picking up a double windrow, which is, which is essentially uh, 44 feet is, is the width that we're picking up. So if you have weeds, which we do in the dry beans, um, you know, you're, any of those small weeds are basically going to fall out. There's a shaker pan on the bottom of this combine. So the small weeds are, kind of, you're, you're taking 44 feet and then you're kind of concentrating them into a path that uh, basically you're going to have a ribbon down the field of this concentrated um, weed seeds, you know, so that's kind of showing the, the shaker pan. Uh, and it works, the, the pick and combine works great for getting quality bean, but that's just one of the things you can kind of see the, um, the, uh, the debris, you know, the weeds are debris, you know, piled up there. Um, and that's not all weeds, it's, uh, you know, bean dust and chaff too. But, um, so we tend to have this concentration of weeds that uh, are, in, you know, behind that combine. So what we started to do um, to manage that a little bit, it, it was kind of by, actually by accident, we, uh, you know, rather than, uh, this is a, the Selford uh, 570, it's a wavy coulter vertical tillage. And so what we'll do is we'll actually run this after the picket combine uh, to get across the fields quick. You can run 10, 12 mile an hour. And so what that'll do is it kind of, uh, any bean resi residue that you have, it'll, it'll kind of pin it and level the ground. But it actually, you know, our, our dry beans are harvested in, in the September, you know, late August, September, early October. But usually in that August, September time frame, if we if we combine and then we run this tool, then uh, you've got time for you know some of those weeds, uh, majority of them, to kind of get compromised. Either they'll germinate or they'll just get compromised with the weather and the environment. So that's part of managing that weed seed uh, seed bank. And rather than um, uh, you know, running a chisel plow where we get it all mixed in, I mean, that's fine, but we found kind of by accident that this is a good way to, you know, with that, uh, because we got that concentration behind the combine, you know, we're trying to, you know, figure out how to manage that. It's, it's a good way to, you know, how can we compromise that, some of that weed seed bank? And I've even thought, uh, I didn't have time, but what I was thinking of too is we've got a smaller flamer that I was thinking of, uh, you know, just flaming maybe a, in a deal world I would, I would flame right right on that uh, 12 foot uh, pass where the combine went I'd, I'd flame maybe 10 days to two weeks after the combine went because you know to help degrade or um, uh, damage that that seed and then uh, so but I, there's not enough hours in a day type of deal so in theory that's what I like to do but uh, um, then we, then we, um, but we haven't ever done that yet but um, then we'll do the residues treatment on top of that, and that um, you know that tends to help too. So that's a, that's the uh, pinnel beans in the picket uh, hopper tank, and then sometimes if we have a lot of weed pressure, uh, this just shows here. It's you know kind of grass and broadleaves. You know uh, we'll leave it out with the windrower because the windrower doesn't uh, play real nice with with that kind of weed pressure, and then we'll either pick it up direct. Um, which you kind of you know got your foot on the clutch type of deal. You got to watch the feeding because um, it gets pretty nasty. And then usually you're usually there's no beans there and it's all weeds. And you're then that's where you're going to break the combine. And then you're wondering why you did that. And and then you're getting dirt in the tank. And um, you know so it's like well uh, just don't have the weeds. You know it'd be better. But um, and then so when you have those weedy areas, then this is what the sample can look like. And so we, we've got a male cleaner that we can take out anything big and anything small, but you can see what's remaining is, uh, is what the, the uh, dirt chunks that are the same, similar size to the pinto. So, um, you know, you've got to have, uh, you know, a better tool to get out, you know, that, that dirt than what we have on the farm. But, uh, so that's the other challenge, you know, so if, um, if you're not managing your weeds and the dry beans, then you, you can't store product like this because you can't get air through it, you can't dry it, you know, so um, it's, that's one of the challenges you just got to be aware of. Uh, the grass, weeds, you know, fibrous root, uh, if you're not severing it with the cutter, um, you know, then you tend to get, uh, or the, or the broadies, uh, you tend to get that, you know, more dirt in the sample. So kind of the, Upper right there, that's that uh, 
John Deere head, uh, 22 foot that we, we stripped it out except for the sickle and out on the back of the tractor. So um, we uh, would use that on, on our dry beans if we had weeds growing above the, the dry bean canopy. We'd use that to kind of make ourselves feel better. Um, but uh, it was kind of slow, very slow, and in a couple days you couldn't tell that you actually did anything. Um, so there's this is uh, weeds growing above the driving canopy, and it actually, um, you know, it looks pretty bad, but it's actually not as bad as it looks. So I, I must be a true organic farmer because I'm saying that it doesn't look as bad as it that it, as it is. Um, but uh, so that's that's one of the challenges, you know. Do we run the uh, the sickle to help, or, or you know what can we do? But the problem is we just the, the dry beans just aren't that competitive with the weeds. So this is we actually um, this is a, was a a tool that we uh, were planning on using. We uh, brought it home from a neighbor, and we hooked it up, and we actually never used it, and uh, um, just because he wanted us to test it out because he never used it. He bought it at an auction sale and. Well, anyway, we uh, we never used it, so we um, and then after talking with uh, uh, well, kind of Reggie brought it up, and then I was talking with Mark Dudla out of uh, uh, Southern Wisconsin, and uh, he was trying one of these uh, weed zapper tools. So this is one of the tools that we're adding for 2019. This is just a company photo, but basically the generators on the back, the electrodes are on the front. Um, the first electrode is, is actually the high voltage, and then the, the next one behind it is, a bit, I believe, the grounding one, I guess. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on it, but... Um, and so this is a, a test field uh, that they did, kind of showing, um, you know, what, what that weed zapper will do. Um, there's giant ragweed that I've heard from other people that works really well on the giant ragweed. Um, it'll work on the grass. But again, you know, you could say, well, maybe it's too little, too late, you know. But um, in the driving world, we're we're kind of targeting this tool for the driving. We've got a lot of drivings organically, and uh, we need some help there. And you know, a lot of your, a lot of your uh, yield is still being determined in that mid to late season. So we don't want to whatever we can do to help uh, um, manage, uh, you know. Or reduce competition for sunlight, moisture, nutrients. So this is, uh, and I was, we kind of thought about this tool for a while, and I was talking with Mark and kind of getting his opinion. He he actually used it, and so he sent me a, a couple of videos here. Um, I'm not sure. This isn't dry beans. I'm not sure if it's blacks or pinos or kidney. Okay. got a picture of it uh, after it's happened. Okay. So there's the generator. And I talked to Mark the other day and he actually mentioned that he's communicating with the manufacturer and he brought up a point that I wasn't really thinking about, but is it the EMF or the, the straight voltage, you know, could be a concern. I don't know if they've dealt with that or, you know, but. Um, so here, this is a, a second pass with the weed zapper in black beans. Um, and the frame, they actually upgraded the frame to a 7x7. Seven seven. This is a lot smaller bar, and Mark said he had the hinge broke on him. But it's just one of the tools in the toolbox. Um, Does it kill them all the way down to the roof, or is it just rip off and burn the stem right? It, it'll kill all the way to the roof, is my understanding. And like the giant red and green, very difficult to kill. You know, it's it's had pretty good success rate with that, to my understanding. So here is running. Oh. So there's running at night. This is from Mark. And then there's um, the display. Kind of shows the load. You know, so you adjust your your ground speed based on what your your bar your uh, basically your load is showing you know so the heavier the um, the weed pressure the slower you got to go and, and so you watch your your gauge and basically that's kind of uh, telling you how fast you can go otherwise if you push it too hard you're going to trip a breaker so that's that's what we're 
a, a tool that we're adding basically for the dry beans for 2019. This is just another tool that we use in the potatoes. This is actually conventional potatoes, but uh, it works the same in organic, and it works pretty well because we it's kind of a rototiller that's specific to, um, it doesn't go all the way across, it just rototills between the potatoes, and then, and then it floats that, that dirt to the top of the hill. So it works good for uh, weed management and, and um, you know, getting a hill on the potatoes and covering the weeds. And you can actually bury the potatoes, so based on how you've got it set and your ground speed, you know, that's, that's where you, you can float the right amount up, so it's a pretty good tool. Yeah, it was dry, uh, but that's dust, yeah. And then this is our uh, uh, organic corn, and I've got on there, it's underseeded with foxtail cover crop. I mean, that's not by design, but that's what it was. Uh, but we've got the cultivators in the picture there. So basically, this is a particular field where it's just got a history of uh, foxtail pressure back from you know, when we were doing it conventional. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. I mean, you could almost, like, you know, as long as you're dealing with it in a timely fashion, you could you could say, well, that's an agreement or it's a, you know, whatever. You know, I mean, it's, um, but, uh, yeah, you want to make sure that you, you know, can get in there. So this is our, our flamer. Um, this is just the pilot, um, pilot's burning. And for some reason, uh, I was the only one that ran the flamer this year. Everybody else was afraid to run it, but it's it's not as scary as it looks. Um, yeah. So at this point, we we already actually um, we missed kind of our broadcast window. So at this point, we got the the burners set to the base of the plant. So we've got um, flame coming in from each side of the uh, you know shooting to the base of the plant. And the weeds, you know, the, the weeds that we see there, they were there, you know, three weeks ago or two weeks ago. You really want to target um, target those weeds when they're like the size of the hair on your arm. Because, you know, you can, you know, it's kind of early and often, like the time meter rotary hole, the best time to get them is when they're small. Same thing with the flamer. Um, but, you know, we, we can still get those. Um, and kind of the what they say is if you want to be able to see... Um, as soon as you go past with the flamer, you want to put your thumb on that the, the leaf of the weed, and if you can see your imprint, then you know that you've got enough heat. You know, it's a combination of um, basically your ground speed and the heat. You know, so yeah, these weeds are bigger than we'd like, but like I say, we were building when we should have been in the field, um, so not. And so there's a picture of the weeds. I don't know if it was, I don't know exactly how long it was after the flame, but from what I've seen, you know, it, it's probably one to two hours after the flame. So you can see the corn, you can see the effect on the weeds. I mean, it's it's pretty instant, um, you know, and it's it's kind of fun to see um, when you've got that kind of pressure and then you can, you know, do something about it. So in fact, unfortunately, the corn was growing faster than my capacity to uh, flame, um, and, and so basically, the flaming window is, um, you know, kind of like combine hours, so to speak, because you don't want to uh, you don't want to uh, be out there when there's dew on the plant. So you can roughly say, in our world, uh, you know, nine, ten a.m. or uh, you know, ten a.m. to ten p.m. You know, I've gone eleven p.m., but I know that. Uh, hey, um, you know my my efficacy is is dropping if I'm starting to get moisture and, and dew on the plant because that's taken away from the heat. Fry some of the bottom leaves when you do that. Yeah. Is that part of the corn plant? Is it basically the stalk? Yeah, the stalk at this point is starting to get you know uh, you know thicker and it can handle some of that heat, I guess. And again, the corn is growing faster than what I can um, 
can get to it. But here, you know, fortunately, we had we had time. We had a rotary hole uh, earlier in the season, so um, you know we weren't uh, we weren't dealing with uh, you know no weed control up until this point. And all you know, so what I'll do is I'll. It's just a judgment call, but I'll speed up and slow down based on like, oh man, if I got a lot of weed pressure here, I'll slow down. If it's not so bad, I'll speed up. And we're figuring, you know, uh, I don't know, like probably um, like eight gallons per acre type of deal, you know, at roughly a dollar a gallon. You can see, so that the, my, my manifolds are frosted up, so everything's running cool until you get to that burner. So this is a view from the, the Flamer tractor cab. Um, and you can see it is having some effect, like this corn is starting to canopy over, and you've got that much heat, and it, it, has, it is having a little effect on the corn, but, um, and then this is one of the last fields I did. It was, um, you know, the corn was getting pretty big, but uh, we can still get through, you know, taller corn like that. What's that water tank on the front That's just, uh, so this was a sprayer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was actually, I don't think I even had water in there, but uh, yeah, I guess if we needed water, that could be, but. If you need water, it's probably too late. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the, the the flamer was a sprayer that um, that was converted. You know, we did all that. So, so this is this uh, single shank cultivator. A few days after the flamer, you can see there is some effect on the corn. But the next leaf, you know, and it's kind of that energy. So you got the seed tree. You have, the energy of the plant is kind of a relay. You know, you've got the you've got the seed, and you've got the good and proper planter. Um, so you get the seed energy and the seed tree, you know, handing off to the inferro and then handing off to the two by two and, and then handing off to your foliars. But, uh, you know, that next leaf is kind of, you know, coming out, uh, you know, so it's, uh, um, I, I guess before the flamer, we had bigger issues with, uh, you know, uh, weed competition, you know, if we had weed competition that was out of control, that's, that's the, the worst of two evils, you know, so. But anyway, so this is our single shank cultivator, kind of like what Stan was showing. Um, you know, you, you weaken that, and like in that one pigeon grass uh, picture, heavy pigeon grass, um, you know, we were basically, in that pigeon grass situation, we were basically right behind the flamer, you know, because you don't have to wait for like a chemical situation, you don't have to wait. Uh, so we were burying that pigeon grass right behind the flame. Um, so we're running kind of high speed. We've got the rolling shield set and the uh, um, wide shovels, and so we're floating dirt, you know, up to um, floating dirt right up to the base of that plant, and then we'll put hillers on there so we can move more dirt. Uh, usually, the first pass we'll just run um, uh, run without the hiller, but then we'll run a hiller to float more dirt. Uh, we don't have guidance. I mean, we're pretty flat, so we've got guidance on. The, we've got auto steer on the tractor, and then on the on the on this pull tank cultivator, we've got guide cones or guide wheels that are that are running in in marks, you know. So, um, but yeah, we are exploring some guidance uh, tools. Like we've got we've got one mounted cultivator, and we'd like to maybe maybe get like a, a slide hitch, uh, you know, and um, you know, and like. Uh, Ben, I'm sure I'll talk about it. They've got camera technology that's evolving, so we'd like to get into that, you know. But uh, for that mounted one, um, so this is uh, this is actually our conventional kidneys that we cut um, here next to our organic cornfield. But basically, all of our headlands on our corn this year, we did uh, we we didn't plant our headlands to corn. We we left them black because of the what we know we have for challenges. We knew we were going to have a lot of passes with the timeweed rotary hole flame. So basically, we 
kind of after we're, as soon as we're done with the flame, we put uh, four HP oat mix down, and that's what's growing on that headland. Um, so we've got some protection and soil building, but that's our organic corn there. Um, this is the 88 foot flamer that's kind of in progress. That's a little bit different design. We were testing it in the field, just kind of the, the tracking and. Um, Here's a sprayer, kind of foliar treatment at V12, roughly. Um, and actually this field, it was between trees, it was a warmer field, and it wasn't so bad when I, was, when I pulled in. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, a, it's a challenge to get, the corn is growing so fast. You know, we had a favorable year, um, moisture, temperature, and the corn is changing so fast, our, our challenge is, is to, you know, to get everywhere soon enough but yeah, I, I pulled into this field and like uh, I was, I already had the, the mix mixed up and uh, the treatment mixed up. And but I got I got halfway down and I stopped because it's like uh, it's like this it's kind of almost too big, you know, the corn was too big. But um, so I actually had to leave some of it out. But uh, basically, you know, again talking with with Ben, he's got a a, a bigger, better sprayer that I'm kind of jealous of. Uh, he talks about. Uh, you know, being able to go into tasseling corn, that's something that we'd like to do um, and, you know, hope to be there at some point. But uh, right now we're kind of limited at this, uh, this kind of this V12 stage. So again, there's just another picture from the road of our organic corn. Um, and, you know, when we're looking for, you know, uniformity and consistency. Again, the, the old P mix on the headland. And so what we ultimately want to do, you know, we're, we're far north, we've got a, a short growing season. Uh, you know, we want, we don't want the corn to have a bad day, so to speak. Uh, um, and, uh, but ultimately we want to, on all of our crops, you know, as far as getting quality, um, and like with the corn, you, we want the corn to, to dry down, not die down. So, you know, uh, ultimately what you'd like to see is that the, the the cob and the shank is, is starting to turn brown, but yet that plant still has enough uh, life and health that it's uh, that it's kind of has some stay green. Uh, so you can you know pack those uh, pack that cob and pack that the kernels you know for test rate and more yield. So this is just driving by. There's some cobs. And then here's mowing, it's another option, I guess. There's some forage pea canopy, forage pea root. So this just shows like, you know, you getting the, you know, whether it's a forage pea or any crop, but getting that, you know, these peas were treated, but you know, getting that crop to be at a, um, you know, uh, coming out, out of the gate fast. Uh, versus the weed, you know, so the weed, you know, tying weed rotary hole can take out that emerging weed. There's some nodulation. And then after, this was a couple years ago, but after those peas were taken off, then we, we put some oats down and there was some, some remaining uh, peas on the ground. Uh, so we had an oat pea mix, uh, green manure, that we just let winter terminate and then we had corn here next year. Um, this is just showing some drivings that got beat up, you know, with a hail event. And again, uh, you know, this looks pretty bad. Um, but with with the when you have the, the the energy on the seed treat and furrow that kind of thing, these beans actually recovered from this from this stress event. And we were, I think, we got uh, I think it was a thousand pounds or twelve hundred pounds of, of pinto beans off this field. <coughs> You know, we've got the soil crust thing there. We rotary hole to get some oxygen, but um, so these pinto beans, which are ter uh, characteristically not that, not that uh, resilient, uh, I feel like it's because of the, some of the treatments and biology that we uh, have in our program that they were able to recover. Whereas there was there was conventional soybeans that uh, there was three fields of conventional soybeans around this pinto field that basically didn't survive. You know, and that was you know uh, in, in the chemical world. Uh, so that's that same field. And then uh, like with our drainage, uh, basically uh, 
the impact that it can have, surf, you know, paying attention to surface and subsurface. So this is the neighbor's field kind of right here uh, to the right, and then our field is, is the black to the, um, to the upper side. And so what I'll show on here is that we, we, you know, we were able to get our dry beans harvested, and we were actually spreading a, an old cover crop. So we got the crop out, we had a good crop, got it off, putting an old cover crop down, and then on this side, you know, tea was struggling with, you know, and so it's uh, struggling with water, excess water. But so bottom line is it's hard to, hard to uh, farm organically uh, if you don't have good drainage, you know, because you're so dependent on timing. This is uh, from a few years ago, uh, transitional pinto versus our neighbor, uh, conventional cranberry, you know, different bean, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of apples and oranges, but I, I don't know why this neighbor, he's, he grows cranberries and he's had trouble with uh, um, his beans dying off, and I don't know if it's a disease thing or what, but, uh, you, know, you know, again, it's the biological tiled and versus the conventional chemistry and non-tiled. But yeah, you know, there was water stresses that year, and but, you know, it, it just shows that, uh, you know, there, there is differences in the package or the program that we put together. Uh, here's our uh, organic red potatoes from this year. We had labor go through um, uh, at least three times on this field. So that's end of, uh, end of August. And then here I was flaming uh, for vine kill. And um, so that's, it was a little bit later than I'd like. Uh, but we, we were kind of starting to have moisture at this point, so I uh, wasn't able to get everything done that, on time. And then, so this is end of September, and then we we had more rain, like the second of uh, second of October, and then it got so basically got cold and wet. So the next picture was uh, on October 11th. We had I don't even know how much snow it was six inches or something or a ridiculous amount of. Uh, cold and, and snow, but actually the good thing was is that we had enough snow uh, to protect uh, the tubers because we we got down to like 14 or 15 degrees, but we had enough snow that uh, we had you know very little effect on the tubers under the hill. Um, but uh, you know it's uh, it's another weed control option. You know 15 degrees will pretty much uh, uh, freeze off a, a lot of weeds. So, but anyway, so we were able to get them dug, and that's a sample of the organic reds. And then this is just a screenshot from, uh, I was watching the Super Bowl and it's interesting how um, the organic is, is coming into uh, our homes, uh, you know, uh, through the commercials, but uh, they got the Michelob, uh, Michelob Ultra uh, and it's uh, USDA organic, so.